Family Church this morning. I'm so glad y'all are all here. Is there anybody that's just glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. Amen. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are chosen. We are his. We are his own special people. He called us from the darkness of sin into the light of his life and freedom. He called us from bondage. We were in chains to sin. He called us into freedom. We can live and walk in his freedom this morning because we're his. We are bought with a price. Price that he paid. He paid a debt that we owe, but he paid for it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all stand with us this morning. Hallelujah. We thank you and praise you in this place this morning. God, I thank you, Father, for your love that you poured out upon us. Lord, I thank you that we are chosen. We are your own special people this morning. That you love us with an everlasting love. God, we lift our voices and praise you this morning. Father, I thank you that you pulled us from darkness into light. That we get to walk in your freedom. We get to walk in life because of you. We praise you and thank you. Come on, church, lift your voice and praise him this morning. We bless you, Lord. Thank you for freedom. We walk in freedom because of you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Bless you, Father. Hallelujah. Oh, he said.
us today. We are not here looking for another God to add to all the other gods that we may have in our life. We're not here this morning, Father, to simply be religious or to be pious. We are not here, Lord, to alleviate some guilt by just throwing a little money in a plate and paying dues. But we are hungry. Oh, Father, we're so hungry for you. Father, we know government has failed us. We know preachers have failed us. Buildings have never satisfied the longing in our hearts. But one second in your presence satisfies every need and every cry that we have. Father, I pray that I would not just go on and on and on, but God, let me speak a concise word and precisely exactly what needs to be said. And Father, Lord, I pray that at this altar time of prayer, Lord, that you will supply all of our needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise in advance for what you are doing in this place today. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. If you love him and agree, come on, give him the best praise you gave him all day. Come on. He's over there and give somebody a high five and say it's home like a chicken bone. <laughs> or say it's on a chicken bone. I don't know. Yeah. Pam asked me one time, she said, what does that mean? I said, I have absolutely no idea. It just makes me hungry to say it. <laughs> Amen. Thank you so much for being here today and thank you Pastor Paul, Pastor Brooke for allowing us to be a part of this day. Does anybody sense that maybe a special guest is here today? Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't, but I'm just so grateful that the Holy Spirit is here among us. Amen. I realize that there are many people that think that they don't need gatherings like this, that, uh, that gatherings like this have have lost their influence, they have lost their credibility. But you know, something tangible happens when the body of Christ comes together in one place and just begin to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I can't explain it, it's supernatural. But when His super comes upon our natural, He lifts our load, He touches our life, he encourages us. He does things in us and to us and through us that no mortal human being will ever be able to do. And he just reminds us that this is not about me and it's really not about you. It really is all about Jesus. Amen. Yeah, come on, let him know we're thanking for coming today. If uh, you're here and don't know who we are, it's good to have my wife, Pam. We are David and Pam. Couple Pam, would you just stand and wave at people? She says, I would give her the microphone, but she says, I talk too much as it is. So just say what we, you need to say. But uh, we are, for those of you who don't know, we're international evangelists and we just travel everywhere. Uh, I'm a missionary to everywhere. Wherever God opens the door, if it's a funeral home, I'll preach at the funeral home. You know, I've got a lot of those. And uh, we're just so grateful to, uh, to be here today. 
majority of our work, some of you know, is in Kenya, East Africa. We also minister very frequently in uh, Nicaragua. And uh, in fact, this last year, we, we went to both places four different times. Took four different trips to Kenya, four different trips to Nicaragua, and uh, have so many other places that are crying out for ministry from us. And whatever you sow today is going to help us to touch the nations of the world internationally, but also you're going to empower us and help us to go to the next place. Next weekend we'll be in Patterson. Big metropolis of Patterson. But you know, Patterson, Texas, and small places are in just as great a need of the presence of God we feel here today as, as Cyprus is. Amen? Amen. And so thank you for giving. We'll, we'll share a little bit more later on, but I'm ready to preach the gospel. Amen? I don't want to break what the Holy Spirit is doing. In Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, we find a very familiar passage of Scripture. That really preaches itself. And I, I have sincerely prayed and asked God. We have been joining you guys in this time of seeking the Lord. Fasting and, and prayer. And, and as, as pastor has, I know he has taught this. Fasting is not doing something or neglecting our bodies or Facebook or PlayStation or whatever just to earn the favor of God. The whole purpose of fasting is to cause us to realize that so often it's not the devil that hinders our ability to receive from God. It's our flesh man. I have, I have realized, I knew it before, but it has become living in my heart that David Copeland's biggest problem is not Satan. David Copeland's biggest problem is David Copeland. And this last year, he has made me acutely aware of the fact that I have been more soulish dominated than I have spirit dominated. That's not in my message. That's just free, free information there. And that's the whole reason for fasting. It's not to earn the favor of God. It's not so we can go about saying, oh, we fasted, we fasted. But there is something going on in the larger body of Christ. It's across denominational lines. It's across racial lines. It's across international boundaries. Believers have been fasting since right after Christmas. And everyone is doing it differently. And it dawned on me this week. We've got churches and, and people that will be fasting way on into February. Some of them are just starting their time this weekend. I realize you guys are going to be ending next weekend. But can you imagine what is going to happen as we allow the Holy Spirit more authority in in our lives, not just in our little group here in Cyprus, but all over the world, there is an awakening to, in, in people's hearts to realize we need more of Him. And as we give Him more of us, He is able to take possession of more of us and do more through us to touch the world and let people know He's the King. He's the King. He's the king. He's the king. Luke chapter 14, verse 15. I'm going to read fast because I've, I've got so much bottled up inside me. I don't want to preach until 4 o'clock. Although I could. I really could. And when one of them that sat at me heard him, uh, heard with him, heard these things, he said, Blessed is he that shall eat, me, eat bread in the kingdom of God. And he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them which were invited, they were bidden or invited, come. Somebody say come. come. For all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground and I've got to go see it. 
Please let me be excused. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I, I'm going to check them out. I'm going to prove them. Please let me be excused. And another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. This continuously just is most, the most amazing thing I've ever heard in my life. The Maasai people that we work with in Kenya, in southwest Kenya, they've taught me a lot about cows. I'm a city country boy, or a country city boy. Never owned a cow, owned lots of dogs and more cats than ought to be legally, humanly allowed. And I love a smart cookie. But why would anybody buy a piece of property before they look at it first? Just, just ask a question. Who in their right mind would buy five yoke of oxen without having the vet check them out? Because that's one thing the Maasai brothers have told me. They said, Pastor David, never buy a cow unless you check him out. And yet here is the excuses that are being given to the master, i.e. Jesus, God the Father, I, I, I bought a piece of property and I, I haven't seen it yet. You might be buying dirt in a basket. <laughs> I bought five years. I understand I've married a wife. Not that I'm belittling Pam or, and I'm not saying she hinders me from doing the work of God, but I understand sometimes there's family responsibilities that you just have to stop and do, especially if you're the head of the house. Somebody say, amen. I understand family obligations. But then the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, go quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind, the paralyzed, the afflicted. And the servant said, the ser it's like the servant already knew what the master was going to say and he went ahead and did it before the servant told him to do it. Sometimes we don't need a thundering prophetic word from God. We just need to do what we know to do is right because it's right in the eyes of the Lord. It's been said that integrity is what you do in secret. And character is really what you do in secret, not what you do openly. It's what you do in that secret place. And this, the, the servant, he already anticipated what the master was going to ask him to do, and he went ahead and did it anyhow. He said, done. It's already done. And there's still room. And the Lord said, go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. <clears throat> There's so many things that prophetically I sense God speaking to me about 2014. And I for one am very glad that 2013 is gone. One of the most challenging years of our life. Not going to go back there because it's over. Amen. I'm glad. Amen. And I really believe that God spoke to my heart. I heard it from someone else, but it bore such a powerful witness in my spirit. It, is, it has revolutionized my heart. I'm convinced that this is the year of the open door Amen. Amen. with narrow openings. That means that there's some things that we have been involved in, some things that we have liked, some things that we dislike, some, even some ministries that we've been involved in, friends, places, activities, and even those ugly things that have seemed to be hanging on to our life. They cannot go through this narrow opening. God is going to make sure that we're going into a new season. And what He has on the other side of this door is far greater than anything that we are releasing and letting go of. On this side. If, that, if that's okay with you, say amen. amen. If that's not okay with you, then just hang on. I believe this is a year of many breakthroughs. Yes. But many are saying that 2014 will be the year that all the economies of the world will collapse. 
Many, many in the finance industry are calling for a global currency reset because of, of, of all of the drama that is, uh, is produced in the financial markets because of so many different, different currencies. And what they're doing is they're crying out for the man of sin to be revealed, a man or a woman, if you please, that will stand up and say, I have the answer to all the problems of the world and we know who that guy is. It's Antichrist. Be a lot of drama. There will be more judgment if that's the way you want to look at it. The CDC has told us that this is already, and we're just now in January, halfway through January, that this is already the worst year in the history of record keeping for the flu. 30 people in Alabama alone have died just up until the 1st of January because of the flu. We know Islam is still going to be killing and kidnapping and crucifying. Mankind will still continue to think that he's smarter than God is. And as sad as it burdens me to say, there will be more people that walk away from God. More people that will disengage and disconnect from bodies of believers like this because they feel like that this is an exercise in futility. More wars, more rumors of wars, more deception. But in the middle of all of that stuff, in the middle of all of the bad, in the middle of all of the drama that will come and visit your address, Jesus is still issuing a call to all of mankind. And that call is simply, come. Yes. Come. He's saying, come. I don't have a deep, deep theological sermon for you. I, I, I'm weary of, of this pressure that we have felt upon ministers that we've got to come up with an even more dynamic revelation that will beat last week's revelation when we haven't harnessed even the power of the first revelation that was revealed to us. Anybody hear what I'm saying? The, great, the, the most prophetic commercial, not pathetic, but prophetic, commercial that's on TV today is the AT&T commercial. It's not complicated. <laughs> My most favorite of all these little kids in the AT&T guys commercial is the one where the little boy is saying, look, I can do two things at one time. And he's shaking his hand and he's moving his leg like that. And, you know, he's doing this. And oh, every time I see that, I just, I've got to go find it on YouTube and get a laugh. It's hilarious because that's the way some of us are having to live our lives. We're doing so many things at one time and the AT&T guy he's so stoic you know and he says my word that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen and this young girl tries to speak up and he said no 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 quiet I gotta see this it's the most amazing thing I've seen we have made living for Jesus more complicated than what it really is no wonder, and I'm not, I'm not making light, neither am I trying to be critical, and I'm not just browbeating people who are not here, but I have a burden today for those who have been disconnected from the body of Christ. Those who feel like that they can live better at home, that they can being a part of a, of a, of a community of believers. And I've been to some of those churches, and I'm telling you, if that was the only church there, there was to go to, I would. But we've made building a building and, and, and being, a, a, being uh, awarded the keys to the city or being recognized in a, in a larger extent. We've made that the main focus of our life and we've missed the whole calling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not telling us so much to build. The Holy Spirit is not telling us so much to do. But the Holy Spirit is saying, come. He's simply saying, come. There has been an invitation that has been given to us. And that invitation that has been given to us is given with the hopes and the confidence that there will be a favorable response. The word come is used at least 2,100 different times in the scripture and it's used in various ways and capacities, but there are many, many, many times, hundreds of times that the word come 
is used in the New Testament, on, even in the Gospels by Jesus. And as it is used, it is used as an imperative command. Come. Come. It's not to be analyzed. It's not to be voted on. We're not going to sign any ballots. We're just going to determine if we are going to respond. Because Jesus, the Christ, God the Father, has gone to an unusual amount of expense. He's gone to an unusual amount of effort to send His only begotten Son, not just so that we could gather here and feel this warm, fuzzy feeling and all want to get together and sing Kumbaya and oh yes, and get this warm, fuzzy feeling, but He's issuing us an invitation. Every one of us. And see, some of you think that I'm just preaching to the lost. I'm not just preaching to the lost. Uh, some of you think that, that you've already checked out on me because you think, well, this is only a message to backsliders. It is to them, but this message is for every living, breathing human being. Yeah. If you're backslidden, yeah. you can come today and find your sins all washed away by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. If you've never asked Him to be the Lord of your life, today is the day that you can find your own new beginning. But to the believer... And to the mama, and to the dad, to the young student who is trying to figure out what they're wanting to do in their life, to the young person who is angry at the world because life as they thought it would be has never been or turned out the way they thought. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is telling you, come, 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 because I will make all things new. Have you ever gotten an invitation to a birthday party? Anybody? Anybody got an invitation to a wedding recently? How many of you, when you got the invitation, you already had made up your mind you're not going? Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Sometimes we get these invitations and we think we're smiling, you know, we got the happy face. Oh, yes, I'll be there, I'll be there. And we're lying right there. We already made up our mind we're not going. And we think, all they want is money. Because they always have a habit of letting you know where they're registered at. Walmart, Target, J.C., Penelope. And while that is, does have something to do with it, in reality, it dawned on me recently, the reason people give us invitations to these events it's not just so that we, if they can get cash or gifts or cards or money to go on a honeymoon with or whatever, but it's because they think something of you to the point that they want you. They want you to experience their special day with them. The next time you get an invitation to a birthday party, while you may want to hack and spit and, and, and really in your heart you want to say, I don't have time for this event. <coughs> Remember, the reason that you're getting that is not just so that this cat can get some money or some cash or some presents. It's because they want you to be a part yeah. Yeah. of their special day. Yeah. Yeah. Something to celebrate. Jesus is giving us an invitation today and he's hoping that every one of us in this room will respond. It is an invitation, but if we could look past that for just a couple of minutes, we will find out that when Jesus says come, it's not just an invitation to be thought about or, oh, maybe, I, I, what if I don't have time? Really and truly, it is an imperative command because there is something good that's going to come out of our responding to Christ in the right way. Number one, the reason that Jesus says come is because we know, we know, He's made it clear that if we come to Him, He will lift our burdens. When we come to Jesus and we respond to that invitation to come, it's because He wants to lift the heavy burdens that are in our life, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. It's coming on the screen. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke 
upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Is there anybody here that is just kind of tired? Anybody? Pam and I, we, we, uh, we visit a couple quite often, and they have uh, some sons. And when those, those sons were in school, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, every time I'd see them, I'd say, how are you doing, man? Oh, man, I'm so tired. Oh, I'm so tired. And we laugh at that, but I don't know anyone who is not fatigued in some way. And it's not just because... Well, some of it is that you stayed up till 4 o'clock this morning playing, working Facebook. Most people do go to bed at a decent hour. They don't stay on Facebook all night. But some people, every time I get up, I sometimes, I'm, I'm addicted just like y'all. I get up, go to the bathroom, get a drink of water. I got to check my Facebook. It's 3.30 in the morning. Come on, what is this? And we wonder why we're so tired. We've got, a, we, we've got so many distractions and so many pressures, but every one of us in this room, we have scorecards that are full of the times that we heard Jesus say, come, and we came to Jesus. And just, why, Maybe it was when we were worshiping. Maybe it was when we were, we were kneeling at an altar. Maybe we were beside our bed at, at night. Maybe we were driving down the road and we just had, we heard the Holy Spirit say, come, and we just begin to cry out to the Lord, we begin to call on the Lord, and suddenly, before we realized it, the burden was gone. All that pressure was gone. The fatigue was gone. And we, we, we thought, man, I can run through a troop and leap over the wall. Oh, yeah! You know why? Because Jesus calls us to come because He wants to lift the burdens. He's made it plain. That is one of His jobs. He said, come. Trade yokes with me. Give me your burdens and I will give you rest. Yes. If there has ever been an hour that the people of God need to come to Him, maybe you don't, maybe there's no hideous sin in your life. Maybe you don't need a financial miracle. Maybe you don't need a miracle of healing in your body. But there are many people in this room today that need to take some time. And I'm not going to be very much longer, but you need to take some time just to enter into the presence of the Lord and just allow Him to give you some rest. Because he said that when we enter into his rest, Hebrews chapter 4, we cease from our own works. Just like God did from his. So if we come to Jesus, we know he'll lift our burdens. Now this one you may not shout over. But he's giving us this imperative command to come. And if we come to him, then we must take up his cross for us. And follow Him. We must take up His cross for us and follow Him. This is Jesus' word, not Paul's words. Not Peter's words. Not John the Beloved's words. These are words in red. Jesus. Luke 9.23, it's coming on the screen. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same yes. shall save it. What is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Whosoever will be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Again, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm not trying to bash any other group. But they're, you know, you know uh, American, it's not just American people. All of humanity, they don't really like this talk about the cross because they know it's going to cost them something. Please. Understand, I am a grace man. I am a mercy man. I am not one that is crying for justice. If you want justice, you better, you better hang on because what if you end up on the wrong side of justice? 
Because Charles Spurgeon said, the great prince of preachers from years gone by, Baptist guy of all things, said, justice is getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Talking about the good things of God. And mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Oh, I need some of that. I need a lot of mercy. I need a lot of grace. I'm, I'm a man of grace. I'm a, I'm a man of mercy. And you see, so many people accuse me, Copeland, you just, you're too driven. I know I'm passionate, and I know that sometimes my passion for the Lord and my passion to preach can some, sometimes, it can even override the anointing and turn people off and say, oh my God, that guy's a little weird for me. But don't let my passion keep you from hearing what I'm saying today. I'm grateful for His grace. I'm grateful for His mercy. But in 2014, there will be a lot of people who will check out on Jesus because they don't like the fact that He's going to ask them, if you will let go of what is in your hand, I will give you what is in my hand. And many will be called to ministry. Many will be called to sacrifice. Many will be called to give things up that are very close to them, that they feel very important to them. And, and, and as you do that, you will be accused of being caught up in a law. You will be accused of trying to work your way into salvation. But the grace of God and the mercy of God has set me free from trying to earn your approval. I'm not here to earn anyone's I don't preach to earn anyone's approval. I don't preach to earn God's approval. I preach because the overwhelming love of God has issued a call into my heart that says, Come, and something on the inside of me won't let me stay. One man said it this way, you cannot go with God and remain where you are. Good. Come on. That's right. I never, I didn't grow up in a preacher's home. I grew up in an alcoholic's home. Yeah. Yeah. Grew up in the home of a pedophile. Drug addict. I got all kinds of good, juicy stories. But you know something? The love of God and the grace of God has set me free from all yeah. of that. I'm the first yeah. preacher in my family. So I don't have, if you have that heritage, God bless you. And we're trying to give our children that kind of heritage. But for many, there's somebody in this place that God is calling. He's saying, come. And you're scared because you know that when you come, he's already been talking to you about letting go of some things. About surrendering. Some things. What a powerful flow. That's when you started that song. I surrender all. Because that is really the biggest hindrance to us being able to embrace this call from the Holy Spirit to come. Individualism, which our country is founded on, in which our Constitution gives us as citizens. These certain inalienable rights that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet when individualism is pushed outside the boundaries of Scripture without the Word of God being our guide, individualism without the presence of God will always produce rebellion, greed, selfishness, and corruption. I'm grateful to live in a free country. Yes. I'm grateful. I do believe in free will. I was watching a program the other night. Oh, it's, it's a bad program. It's called Person of Interest. Anybody watch that program? Jim Caviezel is on there who played Jesus on Passion of the Christ. It's so cool. Don't mess with Jesus. He'll bust you in the mouth. <laughs> Something was said on that program at the close the other night, and when it did, I began to weep. You know, sometimes God will even use worldly things to get your attention. Yeah. Old Finch said, Mr. Reese, free will always comes with a cost. And that cost is to be personally responsible for how you treat your fellow man. That's it. That's it. That's it. They're preaching the gospel. Yes. Come on. Yes. I'm grateful for free will. 
I'm, gl I'm grateful that God is not making me do anything I don't want to do. You're free to come. You're free to go. You know, that's what makes being a pastor so challenging and heart-wrenching at the same time because we don't have any strings on you. You can leave here and you can go to another church. You will not be cursed. Come on, somebody. You will not die and go to hell if you leave Harvest Family Church and go somewhere else as long as you go somewhere else to serve God. Amen. Yes. There's a lot of people still under bondage to this mess. Amen. But God gave us a free will. Amen. But sooner or later, the thing that drives you from one church, if you don't deal with it, it will drive you from this church. The same issue that drove you from the last marriage, it's going to drive you from this marriage if you don't deal with the issues you had with her. It's going to show up with this. Come on, somebody, wait a minute. The same issue that caused you to run from another state, and can I say this? I'm not being ugly. Even if something drove you and chased you away from another country to this country, sooner or later you're going to have to deal with the spiritual issues that are causing you to run, 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 run. And Jesus doesn't want you to run away. He's saying, come, come, come. While I have a cross with your name on it, if you will pick up this cross and follow me daily, I will give you the power to let yes. go of whatever yes. you need to let go of. Does that make sense? We're so afraid, we want to keep our fist clenched because we've worked so hard to get where we are. We've worked so hard to have what we have and we've lost so many times that we're afraid to freely give. But see, Jesus does everything totally opposite the way the world does. Yeah. Come on. He said, freely you've received, now freely give. Yeah. Yes. In fact, if any of you here need forgiveness, I, I double dog dare you. You know, that's, that's, I mean, that's like the laws of Medes and the Persians, you know, according to the Christmas story. <laughs> I double dog dare you to forgive that one that hurt you last time. I triple dog dare you to let go of this thing that God is dealing with you about. Maybe it may not. God may not be calling you to travel to Kenya with me. He may not be calling you to go to Nicaragua or to Haiti or to some other country, you know, where you'll never see your loved ones ever again. But let me tell you something. Kenya's not so bad. Nicaragua's not so bad. Haiti's not so bad. It's unusual, but it's not so bad when you're in the center of God's will. Yeah. And if you will pick up His cross He has for you, the great thing about God is, is that He will never let you carry that cross by yourself. Yeah. In yeah. fact, even Jesus Himself couldn't carry His own cross. That's right. He will always give you somebody that will help you care. Jesus couldn't even carry his own cross. He fell under the weight of that. But then they found this guy named Simon of Serene that come along and helped Jesus to finish his trip to Calvary. And lastly, musicians are coming. Lastly, if we come to, come to him, he's, he's telling us to come. He's issuing this call for us to come to him. Pleading with it, giving us an imperative command. He's giving us an invitation, a nice, pretty invitation. It says, Supper is now ready. All things are now ready. Everything's ready. Come. But it's also an imperative command that if we blow it off or ignore it, we're going to miss something that He has prepared for us. That's right. That we're going to need in this next season. Amen. John 6. Bring that on the screen. John 6. I'm going to read it from the screen. Jesus, he's in this discussion with the Sanhedrin guys. They got their belly full the day before. And, you know, they start talking about bread. Life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that you also have seen me and believe not. 
You see, the problem was, is Jesus had the first golden corral meeting in the history of mankind. He took five loaves of bread and two fish and fed 5,000 men. That's just the men. That's not counting the women and children. They got their belly full and they, in fact, earlier in the chapter, he said, he, they came, oh, give us some bread, give us some bread. And Jesus said, you, you're not asked after me. You're not seeking me for what I can really do for you. You're just seeking me because you got your belly full yesterday. Then he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. He said, Moses, I always want to go back to Moses, you know. Moses, our father, gave our fathers bread in the wilderness. And Jesus said, this is the Alabama version. Jesus said, and yeah, they did. But I am the bread that comes down from heaven. And I've said this to you. Look at that. I said this to you, and you also have seen me and believe not. But watch, watch this. This is verse 37. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Of all the definitions, if you're tearing it up in the Greek and the Aramaic and the Hebrew and uh, the message and the NIV and the KJV, J, boom, 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 all of that stuff, it can also be translated like this. Everyone who comes to him, he will not push away. This is hard for us, especially those of us who've grown, grown up in religious homes. Maybe we've had abusive parents or maybe we've been a part of a church that we wanted to be close to the leadership but they pushed us away maybe you give your heart and your body to a spouse and in the beginning it was a wonderful thing but after a short period of time that spouse pushed you away it's hard for us because of the drama and the trauma of our life to believe that Jesus really is calling us to Him and the only motive He has is because He wants to be close to us. He wants to walk with us. He wants to be a part of our life. But because that we have been rejected, because we've been pushed away by so many people, places, and things, we cannot wrap our brain around the fact that this call is going to, this, this preacher's just working us up. You know, they just want us to come down to the altar. They gonna, somebody's going to push us down. Somebody's going to kick us, you know. They're going to teach us how to speak in tongues. No, 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 no. I know this guy. I'm not going to do it, and I know he ain't going to do it either. If you fall out, that's just, you're just going to fall out. That's, you know. God wants you to speak in tongues. I believe that. But that's not the ultimate goal that we have here. My, I have a commission from the Father to you today. And that commission is simply one word. Come. Just come. Just come. And immediately when we, we think of all these excuses, man, you know, I'm getting hungry. Man, I've got this to do. You know, I've got to, we had no family time all week. And yet, when we go home, we're going to get caught up in the playoffs or TJ Maxx or Ross. Or, you know, we're going to get busy planting flowers or just, and it's going to be midnight and we ain't had any family time yet. Hello? But he's saying, come, I don't have time to come, man. I'm on the schedule. I'm on the schedule. I like being on schedule. But sometimes he just wants you to come. You know, sometimes when, and I'm a workaholic, and I'm high strung. I know you couldn't tell that. <laughs> but sometimes Pam will just push the computer out of the way, or she will push the paperwork out of the way, or she will grab the steering wheel while we're driving down the highway and say, And sometimes she doesn't want me to buy her anything. She would like it if I picked up my dirty clothes sometimes, put them in the right place. But sometimes she just wants my undivided attention. 
See, for many of us, this time of fasting and prayer has awakened something in our heart and just made us realize, you know something? I've been tipping God. I've been just, you know, I've been tipping. Making promises that I never keep. And we're so afraid that if we spend too much time in God's presence, He's going to make us quit our job. He's going to make us give our house away or give our car away or something like that. Let me tell you something. If you get to that point and he starts asking you to give some things away, it's only because that has become your God and he's long ceased to be the Lord of your life. I'm, I'm speaking from personal experience. But he says, come. He says, come. What else does God have to do to prove his loyalty to us? See, the whole common denominator in this whole message today for the last close is that mankind has always wanted God to accommodate him. Mankind is always, we want to bark at God and say, give me my healing now. Give me my Mercedes now. Give me my money. It's my money and I want it now. Give me my touch now. And if I don't get my touch now, I'm going to go somewhere else where I can get my touch. And we're just chasing. We're chasing, 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 chasing. We ch think we're chasing God when we're not really chasing God. We're chasing what we want God to do for us. And let me tell you, God will do far and above all that we can ask or think. Ephesians 3.20 According to the power that works in us. Mankind has always wanted God to accommodate him. But who in this place would say, you know something, Copeland? I'm willing to accommodate God. I don't want God to have to stop what he's doing to meet my demands. I want to say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. How many of you ever said, Lord, I will go where you want me to go? Anybody ever said that? Yeah. Anybody ever said when you've been praying, you've been caught up in the moment? How many of you ever said, Lord, I'll be what you want me to be? Anybody ever said that? Anybody ever said, Lord, if you'll just touch me, if you'll just lift this burden, if you will alleviate the, this problem that I have, I promise I'm not crying uncle. I'm serious, God. I will do whatever it is. You Anybody ever said that? Can I tell you something? He heard you. He heard you. And he hasn't forgotten. But how many times has he lifted our burdens? How many times has the cross that we picked up, we thought that would be so horrible, it's been the greatest thing that ever happened in our lives. How many times have we felt like if we really obey this, this call of the Spirit to come, if we do that somehow, how many times have we thought, I, 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 I'll come, but you know, I'm telling you, He's going to push me away this time. Let me tell you something. If He's calling you to come, He's not going to push you away. Your husband may push you away. Your, your physical father may push you away. Your mother may uh, push you away. Your, your boyfriend may push you away. Your girlfriend, your spouse. The pastor at times may have to push you away. But I promise you today, if you will listen to that still, small voice of Jesus speaking to you, he saying, come. I've got some good revelation I wish I could preach to you. But you know something? He is wanting his people to come. Amen. If you don't know Jesus, he's saying, come. I'll save you. If you're away from Him, He's saying to you that are backslidden and have, have, have walked out of fellowship with Him, He's saying, come. But to the saint, to the child of God, He's saying, you've been carrying stuff you were never created to carry. Won't you come and let me pick that up for you? For some, He's calling for you to go a little deeper into Him. He's calling you to a place of surrender that you are so afraid. Oh my God, God, you're freaking out on the inside. But I promise you, the cross that Jesus has, 
He will well equip you to carry it as far as you can. And when you cannot carry it any further, He will send somebody along to say, Come on, we're going to walk this road together. What more does He have to do to prove His loyalty? What else does He have to do to prove His care? What more does God have to do to prove to us He wants to touch us? He wants to lift the bar. He wants to take the anger, the strife and the frustration out of our life. But most of all, He wants to empower you and let you know that when you walk out these doors, He's not forsaking you. Yeah. He will walk with you through every valley struggle, the problem that you have. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to do. I know this is a simple sermon. Real simple. Father, you won't let me get away from the fact that it's not complicated. Father, we've complicated our life with wrong decisions. We've complicated our life by running and running and running away from stuff only to find that where we get to where we're going, the same stuff is there that we left behind. Father, Lord, there's some here that need a miracle in their bodies. There's some here that need a miracle in their marriage. There are some here that need a miracle in their finances. There are some that need healing from an abuse. From a tragedy. There are some that need to know. That you truly are the forgiver. Of every sin. While every head is bowed. Every eye closed. No one looking around. Go ahead and play softly. He says. If you're here this morning. And you have never asked Christ. To come into your life. If that's you. Would you raise your hand. I'm not going to come back and embarrass you. Not going to pull you out. Just going to give you an opportunity to come. And we want to pray with you. I know pastor has some things that he can give to you to help you get started in your walk with God. But if you're here today and you do not know Jesus in a personal way and you are ready to receive him today, would you slip up your hand all over this place? All over this place. God bless you. If you're here this morning and you say, Copeland, I'm, I, I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. I am away from him. And I have been hearing, I've been sensing the Holy Spirit dealing. He's dealing with my heart saying, come home, come home, come home. If that's you, would you slip up your hand? I just want to pray with you all over this place. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, ma'am. The hand's going up all over the place. Please pray for me. I, I'm, I'm not where I need to be with God. Anyone else? Anyone else? God bless you in the back. Anybody else? God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. Just pray for me. Pray for me. God, I, I want to, I, I'm, I'm hearing the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has already been speaking to me. And then you come this morning and, and say these things. I'm, I've already heard this and I need to come. If that's you, just slip up here. one more time. Anyone else? Anyone else? God bless you. Hands are all, all, all over the place. Maybe you're here this morning and everything is right. You know you're clean in the eyes of God. You know that you've not... You're not out of fellowship with Him, but there's something missing. You're there, and He's calling. You can really, you know, you sense Him calling you to spend quality time in His presence. That's what He brought us here to do today. He wants to spend some quality time with us just lingering in His presence. If that's you, would you raise your hand all over this place? That should be every one of us. That should be. I'm not, I'm not going to beg. I'm not going to plead. I'm not going to manipulate. I'm just going to say this altar is open. They're going to begin to sing. And when they begin to sing, I want to invite you to come. I want to invite you to come and just listen to the Holy Spirit, what He says. He's saying, come. Would you come this morning? Sweet presence of God, he's just saying, come. 
because he knows what is ahead. He knows what we're going to face tomorrow. He knows what we need today. Would you come in Jesus' name?